All right. Thanks for joining the Make Guitar Podcast. It is June 12th, 2022. And today we're going to talk about, um, well, we're going to talk about um, the Norman Greenbaum fuzz tone and the ethics of reverse engineering pedals and, and uh, you know, whatever else comes up. How are you doing, Mitch? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Um, so did you listen to the Spirit of the, in the Sky recently? Have you listened to it recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it. On, I watched the YouTube talk about it, so I watched the YouTube video for it. And it was kind of a funny video. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I watched a few videos about it. It's like um, the whole thing about you know, you got to have a friend in Jesus. Like that was kind of funny to hear him talk about that because, you know, he's not particularly Christian. Like that wasn't the message of the, the song. He just liked the, the vibe of it. Um, oh, that's funny. I never knew that. I always thought he had to be religious, like, you know, and it was important to him, you know? Yeah, not particularly. Oh, just, he just kind of threw that in there because it seemed right for the, you know, the subject matter. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I never, it never occurred to me. I was thought like, oh, he's like Christian. You know, he's like, you know, it's kind of part of his message. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound like other Christian rock. Um, it definitely has this kind of yeah. uh, psychedelic. Yeah. I guess the girl dancing on the hill against the sun. Yeah. Particularly. <laughs> Not not unChristian, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I watched that video, I'm thinking the whole time like, um, you know, like he's gonna when he dies and they lay him to rest, he's gonna go to the place that's the best. So he must really believe oh, yeah. that you know, like, if you got a friend in Jesus, and when you you die, you're gonna go up to the spirit. You, you know, you're gonna get the key. You're gonna get recommended to the spirit in the sky nice yeah but then i watched this interview afterwards and uh, he's like yeah i just i don't know it just kind of fit in the song yeah <laughs> well the song you know that, that that guitar sound is very striking there's actually two sounds right so one of them is the fuzz tone of the riff mm -hmm. the other one is the sound of like the, the switch like ah, 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 you know oh right right yeah, there was an interview with a guy who, who I guess, not Norm, but another, like a studio musician, and he said he played on the track, and he, he, he said he used an SG through, an, through like a Marshall or something, and just used the switch on the SG to make the sound, and he, he wasn't serious either, like somebody in the recording booth said like, hey, can you give me a weird sound, or can you give me like modern sound or something and he just did he's like yeah i just did that thing where you bend the note and you flick the switch on and off and then the guy was like yeah that's it that's <laughs> but, cool but he was like i wasn't too serious i just kind of did it you know <laughs> and so that ended up on the record you know but then there's the fuzz tone sound which mm -hmm. is breaking right like people people cite that as like their favorite fuzz tone or like among the top favorites like top five on the fuzz tone list you know? right and it's interesting because he's not like a i mean he's a one-hit wonder he's not like a guitar hero you know like that's the only song that anybody knows by norman greenbaum um yeah i, I would, mean I would it say pays that, his rent yeah i would say that that fuzz tone too it's like it tops like famous songs you know like probably like people would pick that if you asked them about fuzz tone they would probably choose that over like jimmy hendrix you know like Purple Haze or something. The Purple Haze might be on the list, top five, top ten fuzz tones. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, but there is something about it. It's very, like, um, I don't know. It's just enveloping. It's a very cool... Um, I, I think it's also the technique. Um, you know, like, he's playing with his fingers, so it does have this... Um, well, it's very unique. You know, it's a very um, iconic fuzz tone. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a few things, I guess, like, there's no, nobody really knows what it is and he's not saying, and it, apparently, like, it, it was some circuit that was built into his guitar, right? And there's pictures of the guitar, 
um, I can show pictures. Oh yeah. Maybe I'll share my screen here, right? And we'll take a look. So, um, like, there's a picture of the guitar. It's a there's Norm, right? Hey, Norm, right? And it's got these two knobs, and I'm guessing that switch turns the fuzz tone on, and these two knobs control it. I'm I'm kind of gonna go and say that it was this maestro fuzz tone by Gibson that someone took one of these out and put it just put it in his guitar. Right, because the knobs kind of look the same. It's got two knobs. This I I don't own one of these, but I'm gonna guess that the sound is similar from what I've heard. You know, mm -hmm. but that's yeah. my. But who knows? You know, I, that's a really good theory. I mean, other people have said that his friend just like wired it up from from scratch, but he probably didn't invent it. Maybe he you know copied his own fuzz tone or something like that. And it's like, hey, Norm, I'll put this fuzz tone in your guitar. So you can sound like my pedal or something like that, but who knows? Or, or if he had a, a a Gibson, you know, fuzz tone, he could have taken the Gibson and just stuffed it in, or put the knobs on the outside. You know? Right. Right. And then and then the thing too is like you know you might hear one of these maestro fuzz tones and um, it sounds different, but like I think like back in those days the part tolerance was was kind of all over the map and. A lot of times, like the Q and A, like the quality assurance was not very high. So, like you know, one unit would sound different from one to the next. So, like Norm's unit could sound different from somebody else's, you know? Right. Yeah, and somebody theorized that um, that part of the sound was um, a, like a almost dead battery, in because you know it's built into his guitar, so the the battery could be very starved. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, who's um, who's that guy from? He was in the Allman Brothers. I forget his name. Played on Layla. Oh, Eric Clapton. No, no, the the other guy. <laughs> oh, Dwayne Allman. Yeah, Dwayne Allman. Yeah, <laughs> he's famous for for um, for preferring like playing the fuzz face and preferring the battery to be seven volts. Like he would get like use nine volt batteries and save them for the fuzz face because the low voltage you thought sounded best oh inter very interesting yeah um yeah the, I, I was also watching something about um how you can step down the power you know like that you can um uh, i don't know if it was a it was a battery system or if it was something that you'd built into a um like a regular uh, nine volt power supply pedal, but um, you can get that sound without using a nine volt. Sure. That's a mod that people do to pedals. They'll put like a star switch on it. And actually it's built into the ZX fuzz factory. Oh, ah, okay. Stability knob and the stability knob is basically like a pot between the battery and the circuit. The turning it turns down the voltage to the circuit. Right. Right. And so then when that, you know, changes the sound. So, you know, um, I would say actually, speaking of the Fuzz Factory, if you wanted to try and get the Norm Greenbaum Spirit in the Sky sound, I would just get a Fuzz Factory and twiddle the knobs until you got in the ballpark. You know, right? Right, right. Yeah, or make a make a, a Fuzz Factory. Don't tell Zvex, but, <laughs> but but yeah, make your own, man. If you're if you're up to it, you know, like it's that's a great circuit to 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 learn from, right? Cause it's not super complicated, but it's fun to make and not hard to get the parts for, you know? Mm -hmm. And there are probably um, printed circuit boards out there that you can buy. Yeah, there's a few, yeah. You can make your own. You can just build it on perf board or strip board too. It's pretty easy. It's not very complicated. It's just a handful of parts. Okay. Right? So you could, aside from all the knobs, you could probably fit that in your guitar if you really wanted to go all, all Norm Greenbaum. Yeah, you could, yeah. You know, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, the Fuzz Factory is a pretty good project. The only hard part to get is it uses the original uses these germanium transistors, and those are a little hard to get these days. But you can still build it with silicon transistors, and it sounds to me it actually sounds just as good. Some people will debate this and say like you gotta have the germaniums, but 
I, I, I have I have a couple and I built them with silicon and germanium and the germanium one sounds great. The silicon one sounds great. You know, they both sound good. A little okay. different, but, but not hugely different, you know. Right. Well, I mean, it has, as you said, there are a lot of things that can make a pedal sound different. It not, might not be the transistors themselves. Um, or it might not be necessarily the, the fact that the transistors are germanium or silicon. It could be the value of them, you know, could be yeah, maybe any game. other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Could be like, you know, everything outside around the guitar, like, you know, like Norm's playing with his fingers, you know, mm -hmm. Pick, you know, it could be the string gauge, could be, you know, um, you know, the pickup that he chose to play with. It could be the amp, it could be the way they mic the amp, you know, it could be the EQ and some other things in the studio, you know, and then all that stuff together to bring the sound, you know. So right. don't worry about getting exactly the sound that he's getting just from your pedal turning the knobs. Like maybe that's hard to get, you know, but right. Like, get in the ballpark with the pedal like close and then, and then you know, be happy you have fun play your guitar <laughs> i think that's a really good point because norm greenbaum probably never thought man i want to make my guitar sound just like keith richards or somebody like that like he, he probably like got this effect put in his guitar and he's like this sounds great i'm just i'm yeah. just gonna record a song with it like he never thought i'm gonna try to sound like somebody else yeah because it was, you know, fuzz was new. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's been a long time since there's been like a really radical revolution in um, guitar sounds in guitar music. Um, but hard, I, hard I do that these days. There's so many pedals and so many ways to affect your sound. You know. In, you know, and, and digital plugins and like all these things, right? So, right, hard, hard to, it's hard to make a invent something that's so totally new these days and would like surprise people. You know? Yeah, I think it is, but I think that there's just also kind of a lack of motivation for people to do so. Um, I've been talking a lot about um, death by audio recently. Like that guy, um, his pedal business, I think is there to support his band business. Like he's making pedals that are interesting to him because he's trying to get his own sound. Yeah. yeah and then he's of course selling the fruits of his labor. Yeah. That's a great way. Yeah. He's just, he's an artist. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm going to say is, you know, everybody should be, should, we should bring back the one hit wonders. Mm -hmm. You know, like everybody should publish something to band camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I also I saw a um, a little um, in that interview with um, with Norman Greenbaum. He was talking about like how that song. Um, it was his, whatever it was. It was at the, I'll just put it in the Warholian um, world. And that's his fifteen minutes of fame. He's um, it's it's taken care of him for the rest of his life. Um, he doesn't need to do, you know, he doesn't need to have like a hit album or anything like that. He made his contribution. He's like, this is a good thing that I did. Everybody should have that. And uh, like, like Warhol said, everyone will have their 15 minutes of fame. There's room for everyone to have a spirit in the sky. We don't need the four, you know, the four Swedish composers to like write every song on pop radio. They already have their, you know, they're they're living taken care of yeah yeah you know who knows you know um uh, well i don't i don't know publish it on Bandcamp. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um it's hard it's hard to get, you, to get your one hit wonder out there these days but i think you should have more of those because I, I think there's a lot of really cool fun funky music that came out you know that you know like it was just the one hit you know right you don't you don't get that anymore it's really hard to hard to achieve that these days well it's, 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 a, it's a little bit weird because we've for the for the last 20 years we've been establishing um like the music industry has changed where everyone can self-publish um 
you can promote your stuff on social media. You don't need a big record company. Um, but it really hasn't changed the music business that much. And it's kind of weird. I suppose the whole thing is that it's hard to um, hard to get the promotion, hard to get people to pay attention. Yeah. But then you hear about these bands like Wet Leg that, you know, like they had, I don't know, like half a million followers on YouTube or something like that, and they didn't even have a record deal. And maybe, wow. maybe nobody had heard their song yet. I don't remember, but there was some, um, I wasn't interested enough to like follow that up, but they had a lot of followers prior to, um, you know, like having an album out. Yeah. I saw one of their videos a while ago and it, I just kind of shrugged and watched half of it and moved on. But then I saw another video recently and it was really funny. It was super clever. Hmm. You know, it had really good production values too. So like they did a really great video, you know, and, uh, and it was very funny too. So like, I don't know, they kind of, they kind of grabbed me with that one. So maybe I'll check out another song, you know? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give them a second look. I, I de definitely don't think that they're, they're bad. I just didn't really understand like why, why there's all this hype about them. Yeah. I don't know anything about them really, to be honest, you know? Hey, so, uh, you know, we were talking about the Zvex, the fuzz factory, just as a side note, you know, mm -hmm. On the DIY Stompbox forum a while back, like Zvex used to post there, and there was kind of this rule that you could only talk about the super hard on, and the other Zvex um, circuits were not allowed to be discussed. And then it kind of exploded into a into a um, into a big discussion there, where you know people were arguing that wait we should be able to discuss everything, right? And then other people were like, well, no, you know his circuits are his and there's like an ethical dilemma there right but legally you can't you can clone anybody's circuit and that's totally okay by the law mm -hmm. in order to make a circuit that's you know yours and yours alone you have to patent it and the process to patent is very expensive and difficult and some of the stuff too would be very difficult to patent because there's ideas in it that maybe someone else has already patented mm -hmm. right? so um, so you can copyright things. You can copyright like the name. So nobody can call their circuit the Fuzz Factory if Zvex has copyrighted Fuzz Factory, right? You can copyright imagery like the artwork and the logos and things like that. And you can also copyright the circuit board. So the mm -hmm. circuit board design can be copyrighted the artwork for it, but you can't copyright the connection of all the parts. So anybody could connect the parts in, in the same way, but just in a different way arrangement on the circuit board and that would be okay right so there was a big explosion over at the diy stompbox forum a long time ago and then there out of that grew another forum called freestompboxes.org and so oh. half the people moved over to free stomp boxes because they were like well we're just going to let you talk about anything over here and the diy stomp boxes was like okay zbeck stuff is off limits you know you know, i kind of see that um the ethical dilemma, because a lot of companies um, clone a lot of classic circuits, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like Tube Screamers and like all, like Behringer is cloning all the boss stuff, you know? And so, like, I think the ethical moral side of it was where people were saying, you know, like if, you know, someone's a small company, you shouldn't clone their work because it's what they do, you know, like it's their livelihood, like, but if it's a large company, it's okay. You know, and there is kind of a debate there, but then again, where do you draw the line? What's a large company versus a small company? Like when does Zvex become a large company versus, you know, when when were they small, you know? That's, that's a little bit of a Robin Hood. A large company or a small company. What about JHS? Are they large or small? You know, I don't know, right? Uh, yeah, that's a good question in itself. Um, I would say that JHS is kind of, bordering on being a large company at this point, just based on the volume of pedals that they ship. Um, but yeah, they, um, they also cloned a lot of stuff back in the day. Right. So then they still do, I think, you know, um, like a bunch of their circuits are based on, and some of them are, were exact clones of their circuits. Well, you know, and the guy modified a couple parts maybe, or changed some values, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 for, just to go back to the original subject, I, I think talking about a circuit 
should always be allowed. I think being, you know, to say it's off limits to discuss um, my circuits is a little bit silly. Um, yeah. I, I, I think like for Zvex, like he was like a young entrepreneur and he's starting a new company, you know, and, and then he also was maybe a little jealous of his designs. He's like, Hey, these are mine. You know, I did these, you know, you do your own. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think, I think what came out of that is like, you know, he, he, it, it made him a little disgruntled. So he left the forum and, you know, it bothered him. I think a lot of people kind of argued with him too. And, you know, it, he kind of got that thing, like maybe like, you know, a band like Green Day gets when they get a giant record deal, you know, they're like, hey, you're not one of us anymore. You're a sellout, you know, right. He got a little bit of that kind of backlash, you know. I th I think though, like, what happened there too is that he maybe didn't use it correctly. Like he got a little too, it was a little too close to home for him, and so you know, he didn't see the opportunity there, right? So because it could have raised his brand awareness if people were talking about his product, and I think mm -hmm. maybe if he looked at it seriously, the sales he would lose might not be that great because the people that are going to clone his pedals are not going to buy them anyway. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, there are um, other examples where um, like a brand will do things that um, just affect their perception, like um, the full tone thing, right? It was um, uh, sometime a couple of years ago, I think, um, the full tone guy had made some comments that were maybe taken out of context, but they were about, you know, like um, the lockdown or about the masking or vaccining or, or something like that. But um, there were some retailers who were like, yeah, we're not car carrying full tone stuff anymore. Oh, ouch. Yeah. Cause that's, you know, it's like if you're, if you're the, the CEO or, you know, um, creator of some product, um, the things that you say make a difference on on your business. Yeah, Jay Cheslet, um, Josh Scott, he, he had a similar issue. Like he was part of this church. I think it's called like IHOP. So it's like International International House of Worship or House of Prayer. Mm -hmm. I think is what it is. I might get the acronym. I don't really know a lot about it, but apparently he was part of this. But then they had kind of some weird stuff going on there people like kind of thought they were kind of a cult and then there was a weird like kind of you know a me too scandal there right mm. and he was a part of that right so um and from what i've heard too like if you're when you're in there they they kind of don't want you to leave so, like if you leave they send people to your house and they try and or to your place of work and they try and get you to come back you know it's kind of a little weird is what i read about it so, but anyway, yeah. he was part of that, and a lot that would that gave he got a big backlash about that when people kind of found out he was part of IHOP, you know. But then I think he's left actually, to be honest. So oh, okay, interesting. Of, you know, I don't know if he did it for business reasons or maybe he maybe he kind of saw what people were arguing against, right? You know, because they're also like, I think if I recall, they were part of that thing where they spoke with some leaders in an African country and, and it drove those leaders to issue laws against homosexuality. So like, apparently, I don't know if you remember that, it was in the mm. news where they were like arresting, you know, gay men, you know? Oh no, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, yeah, and it was like tied to the to IHOP. To IHOP. Yeah, so I don't know. So like that was kind of like not a good thing to be associated with. You know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that guy comes across as an ethical person. Um, yeah, he seems like a good guy, um, but I, I mean, it's very difficult to tell from from somebody's YouTube videos or even you know like their business decisions. Like, I still have kind of um, uh, mixed feelings about the whole Patreon thing. Like that guy. Um, What's his name? Jack Conte. Um, at some point, he, I think he he laid off a bunch of the developers of the Patreon app because he wanted to change the direction and he wanted to change some things about the way that Patreon worked. And so, rather than like kind of retool with those existing people, he just laid them off. Um, and then he made a video about it. And I was like, I don't know, this is this isn't sitting right with me. But I don't have to deal with it because I'm not on Patreon. But you know, 
I don't know anything about that. You know, Here, here's an interesting idea, though. You know, so speaking of the copyright issues, right? So, and and you know, the ethical dilemma of cloning pedals. So, JHS is famous for cloning a lot of pedals, and they cloned a lot of the Boss pedals. They did a few of the Boss ones, right? Um, and he yeah. also modded Boss pedals. So he modified like a real Boss pedal, slapped his sticker on it, and sold it as a product. Like he did that in a couple cases. But the funny thing is later he did a collaboration with boss so they did a jhs boss kind of combo pedal the boss issued a pedal that was a collaboration with jhs so obviously like boss didn't have that big a problem <laughs> with jhs cloning their stuff of course like they are also the elephant in the room maybe that's the wrong analogy here but they're the big they're the big fish in the pedal sea <laughs> so not really yeah yeah but they're not like they're not known for ripping off other companies. They're actually my point is like like JHS is not competition for them. Right. Right. You know? Right. And I think Boss has always kind of had their image has always been that um, if something like if if their intellectual property is being stolen by another company, they don't spend a lot of time in court. They just kind of stop making that that pedal and move on go to you know something that's more profitable for them yeah it's, it's oh, a different style and i think that it creates a different um like it, the corporate image of boss is um i don't know it i think they've handled things pretty cleanly oh yeah they're great i'm sure they're smart about it like they don't uh you know they, they don't they don't they don't get all worked up over something and then start litigating right instead they're just going to look at it rationally and say like hey is this is this product profitable or not and we're going to keep making it or not make it you know right yeah I, I, there's something that happens to your corporate image when you um get all um, litigation happy oh yeah that can be a big problem <laughs> yeah. yeah you get a lot of bad press not a good idea right um yeah well you had mentioned gibson earlier like when they were suing um uh was it Dean? Yeah, I think they Dean guitars. Two companies, including Dean. Yeah, and that whole like um, buy original or you know what was it? was a play authentic or something like that. Um, oh yeah, it kind of goes against their whole idea. Yeah, and and they've gotten a lot of a lot of crap for that on so many different uh, social media channels. Yeah, especially on YouTube, um, where it's yeah, just a joke. Yeah, that was not a good look for them, you know. So I think you got to be careful. I, you know, like obviously, you know, they're a big enough business where where that could affect them. You know, like small business, maybe it doesn't matter, you know, as much, you know. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're they're a big business and they're a premium brand. Like, yeah, everything that they sell is. I think the bigger you are, then the bigger you know man you need to be <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. you, know, you have to show everybody else how it's done it's the same everywhere right so like you know you, you don't look at your child to show you how to do the right thing like you show your you know like as a parent you show your child how to do the thing right you know and so you know boss does it you know gibson should be doing it you know yeah fender does it fender is pretty good i mean i know that okay so i know somebody personally who um got a cease and desist from Fender, but it was because he had a company that made housewares and things like that. And they had a spatula that had the Fender Stratocaster headstock on the end. <laughs> <laughs> and they got a cease and desist for that. But I think that, I think Fender actually got into that market themselves. So that might be, might be the reason. Yeah. Well, I think in that case, I don't, I'm not an expert at this kind of law, but I think in that case, that's a trademark issue. So they trademark the shape of the headstock, right? right? So that's their shape. They can trademark the shape of the body. That's what Gibson was saying is they're like, well, we're trademarking the shape of like the Les Paul and the flying V and stuff. And it matters like when you do it and how long you, you, you do it, right? So if you've been trademarking that thing for 50 years, then it's pretty solid that it's yours. Mm -hmm. like if you didn't trademark it 50 years ago and then you just decide today that you're going to do it then you know in the past people maybe copied it and you can't go retroactively back and tell them they can't do it anymore right 
Plus, like, if you don't defend your copyright, then also it kind of gives way to people to use the idea. Right. And so that's the thing, I think. And that's what they were fighting in court. You know, like people were saying, like, hey, you didn't tell us we couldn't do this like years ago, you know. And they said, like, some things Gibson could copyright. So, for example, like the headstock with the book, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of open book design, like that was very copyrightable. But yeah, then right. they were kind of saying, like, Les Paul, I think, I forget how it came out, but that was kind of copyrightable, but only to a certain degree, you know, so if it was exactly the shape, but if it was a little bit different, that would be okay. SG was kind of copyrightable, mm -hmm. but if you modified it, then that was okay, you know? So, right. yeah, I don't know a lot about that, but that was kind of an interesting case, but, you know, it wasn't a good look for Gibson. Hey, so I got, let's move on. What were you uh, listening to this week? Did you listen to any new music? I listened to um, a band that I found on the homepage of of, of uh, Bandcamp called Gordon, and I think Gordon? that it, yeah, I think they're Swedish. Hmm. Um, Swedish. Yeah. Wait, how how do you spell it? It's G O R D O N, but it's the first O has a little um, oh, okay. circle over the. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, not that a lot, but the... yeah, because um, if you search for Gordon, you get something different. Yeah, I can't find it. I'll find it later. Oh no, sorry, that's an A. Gardon. Gardon. Okay. And they are um, from Stockholm, Sweden, and. Um, I don't remember which album that I found, but, um, yeah, they are, um, current, you know, they have a new album, um, it says June, 2022. So that's like right now. I think I found it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hey, it's funny. You're listening to Swedish rock. What kind of music are they? Um, well, they were. They were kind of psychedelic, as I remember it. You know, it was. Um, cool. Yeah, it was. It was modern rock, but you know, kind of like a psychedelic pop, if um, if I recall. Well, I'm gonna check them out. Hey, well, you know what's funny is this week I listened to a band called CB3. CB. CB3. Like, CB3. Yeah, like letter C, letter B, Charlie Beta. Okay. Numeral three, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I guess it stands for Charlotta's, uh, what is it? Burning Trio. Hmm. Right? But they're Swedish psychedelic stoner metal. Interesting. Right? Swedish. <laughs> psychedelic, right? So yeah. We're in, we're in sync here, right? They yeah. Were, I guess they had a, it, what they said was they had a jazz band before. They used to play jazz, and then they were like, hey, now we're going to do some rock music, some psychedelic rock, and it's kind of good. That's cool. I'll yeah. have to check that out. CB3. Yeah, CB3. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. We didn't plan this. It just, uh, it just happened. Oh. Yeah, I listened to their album the other day. I took a walk, you know, had my headphones on. You know, the down at um, uh, the Great Highway, right? Hmm. Um, I, I guess it was really windy a couple, like a week or, or two ago, right? And so the wind blew the sand dunes like up onto the to the west lane. So the west lane is closed to traffic. So you can still drive north in the in the east back in the east lane, right? You know. Mm -hmm. but you can't drive on the west side because there's a bunch of sand all over the road, right? So, but but people are like riding their bikes and skating and running and walking and stuff. So I just took a walk up there, you know, and walked along the Great Highway, listened to some Swedish psychedelic stone rock. <laughs> nice, <laughs> good place for it, right? Yeah, yeah, good music for that walk. Yeah, right. Hey, what did you got? Any projects you're working on? Well, today I was working on. Um, um, a very easy project. Um, I'm, I'm making a video about it right now, but I have this a guitar, <laughs> acoustic guitar that I bought from um, um, I bought it from Guitar Fetish. I don't know who they bought it from, but it was um, it was on their you know 
uh, factory buyout thing. So they didn't make it. I think there's a, a logo somewhere, like there was like a sticker here, but I can't even see it. Like I can't even show it to you. Anyways, yeah. I bought it for 75 bucks, and I thought it'd be really cool to put a uh, a piezo pickup in it. So I cut a hole in the top, and I connected this piezo pickup, which I put underneath the bridge yeah. the saddle, and then I drilled an end pin or hole for the end pin jack, and um, it works. And it was super oh, easy. Um, so I'll put the I'll put this video on on YouTube at some point, but um, I would say um, just a early access uh, teaser. If you have a cheap guitar that you like, but you want to go electric, electrify it. It's yeah. easy. It's easy, and you know, like cutting a hole in the side of your, you know, like if you have a hundred dollar guitar or something like that, don't be afraid of, of, uh, of um, cutting a hole in it. Nice. That looks like a great project. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm super stoked about it. So how about you? What are you working on? Oh, um, well, I made a couple uh, pedals. I I made the scuzz box. I like that name. This is like this thing. I actually, I made one of these a couple weeks ago, um, but I put it in this bigger box. This box had a bunch of holes in it already, but I wasn't sure if this board was going to work. So I just repurposed this old box and stuffed it in here. And then I modified a couple things to get it kind of working better. Um, and then I made this other one and I wasn't sure if I could get this to fit in a smaller box, right? But then I tried fitting it in here and I got this one working. So, um, so I did that and then I, I started working on another one of these super fuzzes. This is my updated board. I got it all in the box. It just needs to be wired up, you know? Great. And then I got a couple other things. I, I, I made another ugly face and a couple other things too. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll get those out later, you know? Mm -hmm. Nice. And then I, yeah. I bought these wash shells too. So I got ah, some right. wash shells, you know, I'm going to put something in those. That'll be an upcoming project, you know? I'm, I'm kind of curious to see uh, how the um, the mechanism goes in there. Like, do you have to build, um, like, <laughs> the, the the mechanism into that? Like, is did they do any work for you or is it a total kit? Well, this to me, this looks just like the the bot or the crybaby shell. Yeah, exactly the same. It comes with a with a metal plate for the bottom, and then it comes with uh, the treadle, and then a rubber the rubber plate right here. You know, so you got to glue this on. <laughs> like you got to do everything. You got to paint it. You know, and the the treadle mechanism is any of it assembled or do you have to put it all together well none of it's assembled they just give you like a little bag of parts great bag of parts right actually you know just for fun let me share my screen i have a i took a picture of all the parts right i made a, a blog post about it so um let me see here um I'm just gonna load this up right so so this is kind of what everything looks like right so they give you this baggie and like and like in like i bought three of these wash shells and the baggie on all of them was ripped open so like some of the parts were like running around in the box you know um but this is this is what they give you right you get all this stuff and then let me see i have another picture here of all the parts laid out you know Actually, let me fix that hold on uh i saw in your in your description that they didn't tell you how to put the thing together they don't yeah let me fix this link right here sorry this is like <laughs> I can click on this link to open it up. Yeah. So this is like all the parts that they give you. So you got to figure out how to put all this together. Luckily, I have another crybaby, so I can look at the assembled one and and compare them. You know. The the one tricky bit is like they give you the gear, but 
the Hi babies, like the old ones, they come with a um, they come with a pot like this. It's kind of like a big. This is an old one, right? This one's mm -hmm. actually not bad. I just pulled it out of a crybaby, but it has the gear on it, right? And there's a little. I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a little C um, C clamp or a little C lock ring, right? Mm, okay. You know. And I think that that comes off and this slides off and the, the, the shaft is D shaped. It's flat on one side. Mm, okay. Right. And so, um, the newer crybaby pots look like this. And I bought some of these a long time ago at this like electronic surplus place online. Cause I saw these and I was like, well, I'll just buy three of them. So I have them for spares. I should have bought more. I didn't know that I would use them. But these come with the gear already assembled and the pot's pretty solid, like they feel really solid, you know. So I have a couple, I have two of these left over that I can use, you know. Um, and then I have this old one. I don't know if I could fix this, but but the, the thing is like, yeah, I, these all have like a D-shaped kind of, you know, um, shaft. And I don't know, maybe you could take a pot like one of these kind of pots or maybe one with a longer shaft. I don't know if I have one like that, but you might be able to take it and just file it down. I don't know that you can buy them with a D-shaped shaft. I haven't seen that before. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose you could use a file or a Dremel or something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah, maybe you could do that. I don't know. Let me look at the gear in here, right? So, yeah, and then the gear here actually isn't... Um, it isn't D-shaped. It's not flat on one side. So this is just round. So I'm not quite sure how you're supposed to fit this. You know? Yeah, so that'll be kind of a, an experiment to see if we can get this to work. I suppose you could get some epoxy and just glue it. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, you know? But anyway, so that's that's coming up. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that, you know? Um, that's cool. That's very exciting. Yeah, yeah, I think it'll be fun. It'll be kind of new territory, you know. Yeah, well, I, I, I also have this. I have this treadle. It's a Boss keyboard volume pedal, and it's got a place for one knob. I mean, as far as I know, this works. But a friend gave me it, gave this to me, and um, I have no use for it. So, um, if you can fit a pedal in that, in that, you're welcome to it. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. More yeah, we can do something with that. Well, well. We'll, we'll, let's talk <laughs> all right okay cool should we call it a day yeah i think that was i think that we covered pretty much everything um maybe next time we'll talk about um like why somebody wants to um spend fifteen hundred dollars on a brand new american professional fender stratocaster but um uh, i think for today um i think we're in, i think we're we're good to go okay awesome well, great talking with you, Kirk. We'll do it again. Yeah, always a pleasure. Yeah, and uh, thank you for watching. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Okay.